So we're here for our next video in this new soteriology series. This is really the first content video. Five videos in total as far as I have planned out now. Last video was more of an introduction and an introductory conversation. And this video is kind of the first one getting into trying to, what are the main components of potentially reframing this conversation in what I might suggest would be a maybe a healthier way. Um, and so today I want to ask, I want to think about the, the, the idea of the problem. What is the problem? Um, when you're thinking about soteriology, and again, soteriology meant um, the theology around salvation, the theology around how, are, how is a person saved, what are we saved from, what is salvation, how does it work, that, that category of theological study is called soteriology. Um, and and when, you, when you think about salvation, when you think about the idea of being saved, which is biblical language, I don't have a problem at all with the biblical language at all. Salvation is kind of all over your scriptures, both, tes both testaments, first and second, old and new, however you want to, however you want to phrase that. The Hebrew scriptures and the Christian canon, like salvation, language like that runs throughout the scriptures. But when you think about it, you're going to be thinking about saved from what? And that's going to be another video that we do, I think. But, but today I want to talk about what's, what's the actual problem. If we're talking about being saved, obviously there's kind of a problem underneath it all. Now, in our typical evangelical theology, and again, the, theology is super wide. So all evangelical theology doesn't fit into this single soul category. But there is a brand of theology that most your everyday Christian churchgoer that's been in church for some time, your everyday evangelical is going to be familiar with a pretty standard, typical evangelical theological idea or trope or however you want to however you want to phrase that. And and evangelical theology has has worked very hard, intentionally, unintentionally, directly or indirectly, to present Sin as the problem. The problem is sin. Now, is sin the problem? I'm going to argue on some level, of course, and yes. In the evangelical conversation, when we talk about sin being the problem, we're usually talking about personal sin, like your personal sin being the problem, because the theological, the stream of theological conversation, the theological consciousness is talking about getting your depraved lost, damned soul to a state of salvation, you know, getting, you know, an eternal destiny of hell to now an eternal destiny of heaven. So, so the, the sin that's relevant to that conversation and the sin that we're almost always talking about in that evangelical presentation is a personal sin. Like you have personal sin and that personal sin all those things that you've done all those things that you're guilty of that's the reference to that's the reference to, and that's the problem the problem is your personal sin and something has to be done with your sin in order to get you saved so the question that i want to ask us to wrestle with and think about and i'm not going to i'm not going to try to resolve this conversation in a stupid youtube video all right and again, for anybody that's stumbled into my videos and your only relationship with me is in my YouTube content, this is probably going to feel a little awkward and detached because it's going to it, this kind of assumes a larger conversation mainly with the podcast, okay? But I want to ask us to think about that whether or not this is actually what the scriptures present. Do the scriptures present a problem of personal like individual sin being the problem in the scripture's narrative that God's trying to address. I know that our systematic theologies present it that way, and I know that our, our, our systematic theologies, our Christian theologies, have kind of taught us to view the narrative that way. Like when we see the story of Adam and Eve, we see a story of how sin enters the world, personal sin. Adam and Eve as individuals became guilty. That's not entirely incorrect. That's not even... I don't even have a problem with those ideas, but we kind of use that, we kind of have a stranglehold on the narrative in such a way that we steer everything towards those theological ends. Is that what the story of Genesis, Genesis 2 and 3, was even about? And I'm going to argue when you actually look at Genesis like we do in the podcast, one of the things we're always inviting us to do 
is begin the story where God begins the story. One of our most prominent, well-known taglines is the idea of trusting the story. And what do we mean by trusting the story? We mean trust in Genesis chapter 1. Trust that God makes a good creation that he loves and he's quite fond of. And it's this good creation that will be distorted. So in a way, please don't mishear me, sin is the problem. Because we start the story in Genesis 1, and sin becomes this, this thing that distorts something that is very good, tov mayod in Genesis 1. So sin is very significant. It's a big deal, and it screws up the story. Sin really is the problem. But sin is a problem on an individual level, but also much bigger, much beyond, further beyond just the individual nature. Sin is a problem on a cosmic level. The story began with all of creation. And what we see in Adam and Eve is something that becomes true in all of creation. There's a much larger, much more cosmic, it includes me, there's absolutely relevance to my personal individual sin. There certainly is, boy, is it destructive? Does it cause harm? My personal individual sin. We'll talk more in this series, by the time this YouTube series is over, about my personal individual experience of sin. My point today is to try to get a better framing of what the problem is. Is the problem that all of these individual souls have sin that needs to be dealt with so that all these individual souls can go to heaven? Or is the problem that these individual souls are a part of a larger creation of which shalom has been disrupted? When you look at starting the story in Genesis 1, it's a very cosmic story. It's a very cosmic tale. And Adam and Eve fit within that. Cain and Abel fit within that. Entire nations and people groups fit in that, but the story is not just about individual souls. The story is about empires and nations and all of creation, not just in the Old Testament, but also in the New. Paul will say that all creation groans for its redemption. And I'm not, I'm purposely not going to use like a whole bunch of Bible verses just to proof text ideas because you can proof text anything with the scriptures. All right, I'm not going to try to pull out a bunch of Bible verses to prove how this idea is bankrupt and that idea is wrong. I am going to try to pull the text into this because this text, this conversation should be rooted in the inspired word of God. But I want to leave most of that work to be done by you or others. I want to reframe and then go back to the scriptures and re-examine and ask ourselves, is what we originally presumed or assumed, is that really true to the inspired narrative of the scriptures. Is Genesis 2 and 3 trying to communicate to me how I became personally stained with sin and how this became about individual personal sin? Or is Genesis 2 or 3 inviting me to realize that sin had an impact on all of creation? Was the curse just about Adam and Eve or was there a curse about Adam and the soil and the land and thorns and thistles? That's a very that's a very creation-centric, that's very cosmic. Was it about Eve or was it also about relationships and childbirth and children? Was it about just Adam and Eve or was it also about the snake and beasts? And the story is about something much larger than just something that happens inside of me that needs to be dealt with. That does need to be dealt with, but it's also a part of a larger thing. So I would say this, I do want to read um, a passage out of Colossians. There's a passage out of Colossians, so very New Testament-y for all of us Jesus followers. And Colossians says, let's see here. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I get this reference correct. Um... Yeah, okay, let's start in, uh, I'm going to go Colossians 1, and I want to start reading in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, referring to Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is very 
This is very this conversation that Paul's having in Colossians is a very cosmic conversation, visible and invisible, all things in heaven and on earth. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might have so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and to reconcile everything to himself. So God is reconciling to himself through Jesus everything, it says there. In the Greek, in the English, very inclusive language. Everything, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So, so the reconciliation of the cross is a work that is far more grand than just dealing with a personal sin problem. It will certainly include a personal sin problem, but the th- what is the problem? Sin, but not just sin here that needs to be removed so that I can be saved, but sin, sin everywhere. What sin has done to all creation, what sin has done to the earth and the heavens, and what sin has done to to relationships, and what sin has done to me, and what sin has done to literally everything. So sin is the problem, and in some cases, sin's an even bigger problem than we ever even typically give it credit for. So now what we do is we find that the problem takes a more, it, it takes a, a more proper place within the larger narrative, right? That's what we want to see the scripture doing. What's the problem? The problem is sin, but not just my sin, but all sin and what sin has done to the to all of creation. So that's the problem. So when we think about salvation, when we think about soteriology, when we think about so often it is a very myopic conversation about how I am, my apologies for all the sirens going by as we film this, right? There's this, there's this conversation about my personal sin and my soul getting saved, all these individual souls being saved. And it's not that there's nothing to be said about that. But the biblical conversation, salvation is about this thing that God is doing to redeem all the earth to redeem all the cosmos, to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth. So we're being saved. Salvation is this thing that is a part of, if we're talking about personal salvation, maybe we can even talk about salvation on a cosmic level. Maybe we could even say quite biblically that all creation is being saved. And see, if that feels awkward and funny, it probably is shining a light on the fact that our theological conversation is typically too narrow. Because what God is doing is God's putting the whole, the problem is that creation has been distorted. The problem is that all, all of Shalom, and for the Jews, Shalom was about relationships between God and mankind, relationships between God and creation, relationships between creation and mankind. They often talked about this triangle, God, mankind, and creation. And Shalom is when all of those things are in perfect harmony, as they ought to be. That's shalom. But that shalom has been disrupted because of sin. Sin on lots of levels, and the, the, the consequences of sin have this cosmic, far-reaching, and salvation is a part of this larger conversation where God is trying to redeem and restore all of creation. So see, we have these conversations and our knee-jerk reaction is, okay, okay, but but do I still need, but am I still saved? Like, do I still go to heaven when I die? And we have to learn that what we're doing is we're taking the biblical conversation as it exists, and we keep trying to force it into another conversation. So instead of us meeting the Bible on its terms, we keep asking the Bible to meet us on our terms. The Bible's trying to say there's this big thing going on. There's this big cosmic thing. Everything's been disrupted, and God's trying to put it back together, and God's looking for partners. God wants you to help him put this back together. 
And, and in order to do that, you're, we're going to need to also deal with your brokenness because you're a part of this broken creation. So you have brokenness and creation has brokenness. So we're going to need to fix that brokenness because we're also being a part. But salvation is this bigger thing. But behind it sits this concept, but do I go to heaven when I die? But that feels really awkward in this larger conversation, doesn't it? It just feels like when you hear what 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 Scripture is doing, it, it just feels like. But we were talking about this, so why are you making it about that? We were having this big conversation about what God's doing in the world, but you want to know if you go to heaven when you die, and the only reason that we want to know that is because theology, not the Scriptures, theology has told us. The way, and yes, I understand that theology comes from the scriptures, and you can't do scriptures without theology. I get all that. But the way that we have packaged the scriptures in our theology has told us that that is the question. Because that is the problem. The problem is this sin. This is the sin that matters. This is the conversation that matters. This is the center of gravity. But the scriptures have a different center of gravity. They're having this conversation. And this doesn't go away. It's not that this is like, doesn't exist, but their center of gravity matters. Do you feel that? Do you sense that? The center of gravity, is the, is the conversation revolving around this problem or is the conversation revolving around this problem? Because this matters, but it has a, it has a context in a larger conversation. What we usually do is we pull this fun, well, that's nice. It kind of becomes an add-on kind of a side point to this conversation. And we want to we want to make sure that we're reading the Bible on its terms. So it's not that there's nothing to be said over here. It's that our questions and our emphasis and our focus betray us. It, it tells us that we're framing the conversation in a way that is not what the Bible is doing. And we want to bring those things into more alignment. So there are more things to be said, many more things. This is just one 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 conversation about what is the problem? What is the problem in the biblical narrative? What is the problem in the world? What is the problem that you and I experience? Are we sinners? Yes, we are. We are sinners. Do we have a personal sin problem? Is there personal sin? Are we personally engaging, participating in rebellion against God's order and God's way? And is that a problem? And does that need to be dealt with? Are we going to have a guilty conscience? Are we going to need atonement? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But that is not the center of the conversation. That is a part of a much larger conversation, a much bigger, more cosmic conversation about what God is doing in all of the universe. And just starting there helps us to begin to reframe the conversation so that everything quits revolving around this key issue. So everything else kind of serves this issue. Creation, care, it kind of takes a back seat to whether or not souls are going to heaven. Um, all this other stuff, all, everything takes a back seat. You know, um, uh, moral obedience, doing the things that Jesus had, it all kind of takes a back seat to whether or not souls are going to heaven. But if this is about putting creation together, partnering with God to restore co the cosmos, to tikkun olam, that's something that the Jews will, will say today, the repairing of the world, tikkun olam, the repair of the world, well then, well then my soul redemption, my own personal sin is a part of that. I need to deal with that because if I'm broken, it's going to be very hard for me to engage in this work. But then everything else, creation care, finds its proper expression in God putting the world back together. Um, moral obedience finds its personal responsibility, finds its proper place in what God is doing to put the world back together. Biblical justice, caring for the orphan and the, and, the, and the foreigner and the widow. It takes its proper place because God's putting the world back together. You see how the center of gravity changes everything. Because if it's just about souls going to heaven, well, then taking care of orphans and widows and foreigners, well, I mean, that's, that's nice and that's good and that's godly, but it's, it, it, really, it really just kind of is a back seat to this other thing. But then we see people like James say, this is true religion that you would care for orphans and widows in their distress. It feels like it's a bigger deal to James than just this ancillary, 
It's because James has this more, he has this understanding of the biblical narrative and what God is up to and what salvation even means. It is this, but it's also something bigger than this. It's something, it's something bigger and better than simply what happens when I die. We'll get there. We'll get to, we're going to have some more conversations. I look forward to having those. But this was a good place to start just to frame the larger, more cosmic conversation of what's happening in theology. All right, look forward to the next conversation. We'll talk to you then.